Is this, is this on? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm Jordan. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about who I am and what I'm doing here. I'm just going to go ahead and get into it. Um, I'm hoping to kind of buzz through this presentation about 30 minutes and leave about 10, 15 minutes for discussion. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes here. I'll be checking the time. Um, so, oh, I should say, so um, I'm going to be switching back and forth probably a little bit between person-first, identity-first language, uh, so just disclaimer. Um, this is just a brief outline. We're going to talk briefly about what neurodiversity is. If you're at Temis presentation, it'll be just review for you guys. Uh, we're going to talk about um, just some basic elements of existing neurodiversity hiring initiatives, kind of general, uh, and then some sort of thoughts for future directions of neurodiversity at work. So uh, this quote here describes neurodiversity, uh, basically where neurological differences are recognized and respected, just like any other form of uh, human variation, uh, so comparing it to biodiversity, uh, but just thinking about differences in brain structure uh, and brain functioning. Um, and in some ways, these differences are compared to race or gender differences. Um, so basically, uh, well, we have it on the next tier. Um, that it's natural, it's valuable. There's no one normal type of brain or mind or uh, neurocognitive functioning, just in the same way there's no one normal or right gender expression or uh, skin color, things like that. Um, but still recognizing that social dynamics manifest uh, similar to those that manifest um, related to other forms of human diversity. So looking at discrimination, systemic oppression, things like that. Um, just social power inequalities in general that may uh, crop up when you're considering skin color. Um, but also considering diversity as a source of creative potential. So we'll talk about some, uh, some of the strengths associated with autism, uh, again in generalities, um, but considering what might be useful as, at work. Um, just some basic vocabulary. Neurodiversity describes the entire range of variation in neurocognitive functioning uh, that can occur in humans. Neurodiverse is an adjective uh, describing a group of people in which different neurocognitive styles or neurotypes are represented. So we would say like uh, this group here is a neurodiverse group. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily say a single person is neurodiverse. Um, I feel like, you know, if you're, it may get a little bit complicated if you're describing a single person as neurodiverse. Is that possible? I don't, maybe, but <laughs> jury's out, I don't know. Um, and then a neurotype, as I said, it's a specific style or type of neurocognitive functioning. Uh, some neurotype uh, examples, neurotypical or NT, uh, so that's a style of neurocognitive functioning falling within uh, what society at large considers normal, all right? Neurodivergent is the opposite, uh, so a style of neurocognitive functioning that diverges significantly from what is considered normal. This can be a result of genetics, uh, brain altering experience, uh, or a combination of both. There may be different reasons that's going on. And uh, neuro-minority, I like this term, was coined by Nick Walker, 2014, um, basically describing a population of neurodivergent people uh, that share a specific type of neurodivergence, so certain neurotype um, that is innate to their identity, has pros and cons to it, most likely, um, but are facing discrimination, misunderstanding, or prejudice from the majority group. Uh, so now we're going to be moving into talking a little bit about uh, existing hiring initiatives. Um, so we'll be looking at recruitment and hiring practices, accommodations, neuroinclusive company culture, and some reported benefits and challenges from places who have these types of programs to these types of programs. Um, so starting off with just some statistics here, CDC has updated the, their estimate here that one in 59 children are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So these are people they are just estimating just to be diagnosed, not necessarily everybody who identifies as autistic. Um, based on that, math happened. They're thinking there's going to be a 230% increase in autistic adults by 2025. Um, and this is concerning specifically when it comes to work because estimates for unemployment rates for people with autism range from 40 to 90%. Um, even on the low end of that, that's not great, right? Um, taking a look at disability in general, um, so CDC estimates that about one in four American adults have some sort of disability uh, that impacts it, at least one area of their life in a major way. So pretty significant proportion of the population. Um, 
based on a study, Morgan and Alexander, they sent out surveys to, I think, 600 employers, about 534 returned them. Of those, 365 said uh, they would never hired somebody with a disability ever, so never hired somebody who disclosed a disability to them. Uh, they had never, had never before. Um, and these are employers from different sized companies, different fields, um, so kind of running the gambit there. And about 70 of those said that they would never hire a disabled person in the future, um, which actually actually illegal for them to say that, right? But they're like, they don't care. They're like, you know what? Never, never doing it, all right? They don't care. Yeah, they're, they're like, nope. So anyway, the concerns that they cited were safety of, of the individual with a disability, quality control for their products, productivity, so hours, and then behavior problems that they anticipated might happen, you know, with a disabled person should they hire them. So keep that in mind, because we're gonna come back to that. Um, so these are some traits um, that may be associated with people with autism, with autistic people. Not every autistic person has all these things. This is kind of a, just a general idea of what are some things someone with autism might have that could be helpful in the workplace. And thanks to Wong, Donnelly, Neck, and Boyd, who discuss positive autism, uh, which is a strengths-based approach to autism. What are the, the pros associated with autism? Um, so broken into categories here, intense focus. Uh, so I think uh, as many people here may know, people with autism are generally thought of having some kind of special interest. So if that special interest overlaps with the area of work that your company is in, that's a plus for you. That's good. Um, uh, generally, people with autism are thought to be kind of detail-oriented, have this kind of systematic information processing that may or may not be the case with every autistic person. But with certain areas of work, this can be very helpful. Um, and um, let's see, moving on to cognitive abilities. Um, so not everybody with autism is going to have uh, advanced cognitive abilities. Some may, all right? So that may include visual thinking, as Temple Grandin was discussing. Uh, it may include um, an improved ability to retain information, especially if it relates to those special interests. Um, and also, I want to point out this innovation and creativity, because I think uh, in the past there had been this idea that autistic people aren't capable of being creative. Uh, we're realizing that's not the case. In fact, they are just so creative that we, you know, are not recognizing it as creativity because it's just super creative or something. Uh, so exactly. What is, normal what is this? All right, it's creativity, so it's good. Uh, and also humor. Again, this is another interesting thing because this was, again, it was considered something that autistic people were not capable of, humor. Um, so some um, things here. Uh, sarcasm, satire, puns, and wordplay. And I like this quote. This is from the article, relishing absurdity. So just the absurd things in life. And this is highlighted as something that can be helpful for work um, because humor is a good way to bond with people, to bond with your teammates at work, your coworkers. And also there's certain fields where I think humor is really valued, especially this kind of offbeat sort of humor. So in the medical field, in law enforcement, um, in STEM fields, I think this sort of humor is valued. I work in community mental health, um, so a sense of humor is strongly valued in that field. Um, you know, there's, uh, I won't go into the reasons for that, but it's valued in these fields. Um, you you got to be able to laugh, okay? Self-care. Self you you got to be able to laugh if you're working in that field. Uh, and also, uh, honest and just. I liked this also. So. They highlight here something employers may be interested in, a tendency to follow rules, so employers who are worried about those behavior issues, um, and also just a generally strong work ethic. So especially if it's an area of work that someone is interested in, they want to be going to work. They want to stick to that routine and be doing the thing that they love to do. And also this open-minded and fairness. I liked this also because there's also an idea that autistic people aren't very open-minded. So the, the, where, where they're highlighting this in the article is um, being open-minded towards people from other diverse backgrounds. So if somebody has um, you know, a different sexual orientation that, uh, other than heterosexual or different gender expression or something like that, someone with autism generally is less concerned with that than maybe some people who do not have autism, generally speaking. All right, so moving on here um, to 
accessible recruitment and hiring practices. So uh, this is focusing more on the recruitment end of things, ways to recruit people with autism. So linking with social partners. So these could be government or nonprofit organizations committed to helping people with disability get jobs. So in this area, that'd be like OOD, Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. Arc Industries is a big uh, provider of jobs around here. Food for Good Thought on a lesser scale. So these are some options. So companies can link with these places um, and, and be recruiting in that way. And these organizations can also be helpful, not just recommending candidates and helping in the pre-screening and training process, but may also be able to arrange for public funding for internships or something like that, and also just help navigate local employment regulations uh, in general and also specific to people with disabilities. Also, I think it's important to link with self-advocate groups in your area. Um, so you can typically work with a group uh, to have them review your hiring and training practices and see what recommendations for changes they might make. Um, also recommending candidates and providing ongoing mentorship for autistic employees. Um, so definitely feel comfortable reaching out to these self-advocate groups. If it's a no, they'll just say no. That's the worst thing that can happen, okay? But my feeling is that a lot of them would be very excited uh, for the chance to work with a company on something like this. And this is a big thing too that I think Temple Grant had actually highlighted in her uh, talk was interviewing for the skills you actually need. So at my job, I need to be able to like make appropriate eye contact with people and like chit chat and like stuff like that and we call that engagement. That's important to my job. It's not important to every job. So in a lot of STEM fields, I, typical skills that come up in a typical interview are not things that are important. So really take a look at your job description, be like, what do I actually need a person to have in this job? Do I need them to sit here and like smile at me and stuff? Or do I need them to like build me a robot, okay? Um, so <laughs> figure that out, okay? And really prioritize what skills you want. A lot of job description that I see, it's like 50 things, and you know the person they're actually hiring for that job does not have all those things, okay? That would be crazy and impossible. So um, really take a look at hands-on activities. Uh, so there's a program called Autism at Work through SAP. They have things that are called hangouts, which are actually extended interviews over the course of a couple weeks where they kind of hang out, they meet who works at the company, uh, they may um, do some activities. One thing they do is they have candidates build Lego robots based on very detailed instructions, because that's something they actually need to know how to do, you know? Um, let's see, at Hewlett Packard, they also do something similar where they build some kind of uh, pill dispensing system. So they have them do things that are relevant to their job. All right, that's what they want. And it looks like I've gone on to the next slide somehow. Right, exactly. But the thing is, she solved the problem, and it wasn't actually supposed to be solvable. What? <laughs> That's awesome. So see, you can learn things like that. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So yeah, and I think as Temple Graham was saying, she would bring like portfolios of diagrams and things like that. So figure out uh, what's really going to be a relevant assessment of the skills that you need. Um, as far as creative accommodations, so. Basically, this is thinking about moving above and beyond just compliance with the ADA. Like, what can you do to really support your employees to get them doing the best work that they can do, not just for them, but for your company, too? I mean, that's what you want. And uh, if you're willing to do this, you really see a lot of loyalty from your employees as opposed to just really high turnover. And I think this is true not just for autistic people, but just any employee. You want to be really putting the time into your workers. Um, so. I think this is really helpful, create a work support system. So have teams, you know, let the teams be working closely together. You don't need everybody just in a little box all the time. I mean, make it so that people can rely on each other. Uh, a good way to do this is assign a workplace mentor. So somebody who's been there for a few years who can kind of show somebody the ropes and be available, not just when it comes to the actual job duties, but also just getting used to the company culture. You know, like how do people communicate with each other you know, in this workplace, things like that. And make sure that there's easy access to supervisors and to HR people. I think um, something that uh, I've run into in past jobs is I have a supervisor, I have HR, but they're like in another, you know, city or another state or something like that. That's not helpful, you know? You want to have somebody who 
is easily accessible, even if that's just by, by phone or a computer or something like that. Invest in, again, invest in your place, support career development. Um, so you wanna sit down with somebody, figure out what their long-term career goals are. Help them do that at your company, because otherwise they're gonna do it at somebody else's company, all right? Um, and track that progress, you know? So um, a concern that some people have mentioned um, is that if they're bringing on uh, disabled workers, autistic workers, that they won't be able to give them like regular performance evaluations because you know I might say something to them and then they complain to the ADA coordinator, blah, 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 whatever. So that's probably, typically does not happen, okay? Like set up expectations, be very specific and very direct uh, about what the job is, just can't stress that enough. And really that should be happening for any employee at your company. Um, and you can be flexible on a performance evaluation and still have it be a performance evaluation. Like this is not saying that you can't hold your employees to a certain standard. You're just being considerate of what their needs are. And you should be doing that for any employee. So be flexible, uh, individualized accommodations. So again, this is something you could be doing for all your employees and they're gonna respect that and they're gonna value you as a supervisor if you're able to do this for them. Um, even if this means going beyond what the ADA requires you to do. Um, some concerns that, and this has been something people have said to me even working with like kids in a preschool classroom, like, well, if we give some kids accommodations, the other kids are gonna be confused, all right? So they're just like, we just won't give anyone accommodations and no one will be confused. I'm like, okay, no, all right? Can't do that, okay? Right, yeah. So. And you know what we do with like preschoolers to help them understand this is we're like, they're like, why does so-and-so get a weird bumpy seat pad that they get to do this on, all right? Well, that's what so-and-so needs to be able to sit in your chair, you know? And they're like, well, I want that. I would say just give them that, okay? Or you can just be like, you know, different kids need different blah, blah, blah. Little children understand this, all right? Four-year-olds understand this, so your 40-year-old employees can understand this too, okay? Just have a little faith in them, all right? All right, so, all right. Fostering a neuro-inclusive company culture. So this is really going beyond just work, accommodations and getting people in the door. How do you make the company a comfortable place for people who are autistic or really who have, are diverse in any way, right? Um, representation, receptivity, and fairness. These are the three facets of just inclusive company culture. So for representation, you wanna hire and promote, all right? Not just hire in an entry level and just leave them there for 15 years, all right? Promote them. Qualified individuals from neuro minority groups to leadership positions. So if you're investing in your employees, as we talked about on the previous slide, you should be able to promote them. You should be able to further their career here. And that when you're having people come in on an entry level, they can see hey, there's supervisors here who are similar to me, all right? That's what you want. And you wanna allow equal access to a variety of work areas. So again, the Autism at Work program, when they first started working with people with autism, they had in their head a specific area of work these people were gonna be doing. And then they got them in there, it turns out they can do all kinds of things. They were like, what, crazy. So, um, but, they rolled with it, they were flexible. They were like, okay, you wanna do customer service, you can do customer service. You wanna do this or that, whatever, all right? If you wanna learn how to do this, we'll train you up on this. If it's a good fit, you can stay with that, all right? So being clear that just because someone has autism doesn't mean that they can only do this one thing, all right? And that's helpful for people coming into the company to see that, hey, I can do a lot of things, I'm not being pigeonholed here. Receptivity, so this is just a general openness generally on the part of supervisors and neurotypical employees. So you can do this through employee training, you know, giving them a general idea of what autism is, how someone with autism may be different from their typical coworkers, and how to work with that, you know? And also offering a variety of supervision styles. So I think a lot of people kind of think of a supervisor like, I don't know what everybody has in their head about it, what a supervisor does, but many people have a different idea in their head of what supervisors do, so because they have different supervision styles. So you wanna offer a variety there. Now that doesn't mean one supervisor has to know every style and be like some kind of 
I don't know, people genius who just knows how to adapt to every, you know, supervision style that's needed, but have different supervisors there from different backgrounds who approach supervising it a different way, all right? And fairness. I mean, I think this is pretty self-explanatory, but we're going to have equal pay for similar positions. So uh, seriously. So yeah, I mean, technically, you can pay people with disabilities uh, less than minimum wage. You could do that in the state of Ohio, other states around. That's not cool, all right? Please don't do that. Um, that's all I have to say about that. Um, <laughs> and you also want to be working on foster other forms of inclusivity. So not just narrow inclusivity, but people from different religious backgrounds, racial ethnic backgrounds, uh, gender expression, sexual orientation, and so on, because diversity is a good thing for your company, all right? Um, so just focus it in general on inclusivity. And also involving neurodivergent employees in team meetings and conferences. So I think um, there's some confusion around, like people are like, well, autistic people have trouble in social situations, so, um, you know, I'm concerned if we're inviting them to those conferences and things, they're going to be like really stressed out because they have to do social things now. Um, that's not a good reason to not invite people to your meetings, okay? Uh, I don't like meetings either, okay? But I'm still invited to meetings. Nobody likes meetings. They're not fun, all right? <laughs> Nobody likes meetings. They just want to do their job and go home. Um, so, the, you know, extend the invitation, all right? You want people to feel welcome. You want people to feel like they're at the table, they're part of the conversation. And there are ways to accommodate people if they have sensory concerns. Um, you know, there's technology is a thing. You can bring people in Skype and things like that. This is a lady right here who loves, uh, as I'm pointing at Jillian here just randomly, this is a lady right here who loves, uh, what is it? It's not Skype. It's like that uh, Zoom conference calls. Oh, yeah. This is a lady right here who loves Zoom conference calls. All right, so, all right, so benefits and challenges. So um, these are some benefits and challenges of neurodiversity hiring initiatives that have been reported by um, Microsoft, SAP, Autism at Work, and um, Hewlett Packard, who have uh, these sorts of programs. Um, they found the benefits are they actually have higher productivity and lower product defect rates. If you remember, that was a concern that people had about hiring people with disabilities. Turns out they didn't need to be concerned about that. Also increased creativity and innovation, and actually improved overall communication, which I thought was interesting because working with autistic people force them to be extremely clear and direct in their <laughs> company and communication. So everybody was like, actually, this is awesome. All right. Uh, loyalty and less turnover. So people who are involved in the autism at work program uh, were extremely unlikely to leave because, you know, these people gave them a chance and really worked with them and they respected that. And also the, the neurotypical employees reported higher morale, what they say here. They said their work was more meaningful because they were able to participate in this program. Um, so it meant something to the neurotypical employees as well. And also it's just as good for PR, all right? If you do things that look good, that helps you make money, all right? Uh, there you go. There you go. And uh, challenges. So one of the concerns was disclosure of disability status. Um, I actually looked at an article that was specifically about this, and I'm going to just read from it because I want to make sure I'm getting it right here. So for respondents who are diagnosed with autism at later ages, um, they found it, they found disclosing at work unhelpful because they perceived uh, more discrimination. And then for people who were diagnosed at earlier ages, when they disclosed at work, they felt more anxious at work. And this is just one study, um, so not saying that's the case for everybody, um, but there are some problems around, you know, forcing someone to disclose their disability to get these accommodations. And this program, you know, it's called Autism at Work, so if you're part of it, people know what your diagnosis is, so there's some problems around that. And uh, a lot of these companies are still trying to figure out how do we want to navigate that. So that's, uh, that's something to consider. Uh, also, this idea of fairness of accommodations, which we discussed earlier. Um, so having some neurotypical employees uh, complain like, well, if they get this and that, why don't I get this and that, and so on. Um, and then also that it did create extra work for their supervisors. So supervisors needed to be more available than maybe they had in the past. You know, So maybe they need to be considering hiring on more supervisors so they have enough coverage for everybody. All right, so future directions. All right, so consider a more fluid approach. So this addresses the disclosure issue. So a lot of these neurodiversity hiring 
programs have been criticized for being too in your face. That's the quote there. Um, oh, and actually this is the exact stuff that I just said. It's now here on a slide. <laughs> there you go. I'm good. Um, so um, they're highlighting in this article some alternatives that are possible. So authorizing individualized but informal support. So the benefit there is it does enforce disclosure. The downside is if it's informal, there's a little bit less protection there potentially. So that's the balance there. Um, also addressing discriminatory organizational norms. So if the, you can change those underlying norms, maybe you don't even need these programs, right? Um, so that's a way, specifically uh, SAP is trying to move in this direction. They wanna be so uh, neuroinclusive that they don't need these programs anymore. That's their stated goal. Sorry, SAP, um, I'll be honest, it's, it's a software company. I don't, I'm gonna try to think of what SAP stands for. I don't know. It stands for, I think, something not in English. So I, <laughs> I give up on that. But it is a software company. Uh, they work with a company called uh, Speci Specialistern something that um, works in many different countries supporting these sorts of, of initiatives. And uh, yeah, I just call them SAP because I don't know how to say their name. Um, and then prioritizing neurodiversity related staff training. So making sure that your staff are aware, you know, even if there's not the special program that exists to protect people, that you're being, you know, cool, basically. Um, expanding the definition of neurodiversity. So keeping in mind that uh, autism is not uh, the only thing considered in neurodiversity. Um, and that these HR processes, typical interviews and things like that may also be excluding other um, neurodivergent talent. 46 million Americans have a mental illness as a 2017, 15 million with a cognitive disability as a 2018. So that's a lot of people. Um, so are there steps we could be taking um, to support not just autistic people, but people from other backgrounds as well? And also, all diversity is a plus. So employees value diversity. In a Glassdoor study of 2014, they found that 65% of people reported valuing diversity when looking at potential employers, that's a lot of people. And only 57% said their company was doing enough to increase diversity in their workforce, all right? Um, and improved performance and profits. So this is another one here, Gartner 2018, that said ethnically diverse companies were 35% more likely to outperform their peers. And very inclusive organizations generated about two times more cash flow uh, per employee and were 120% more capable of meeting their financial targets. So employees want diversity, but it's also good for the bottom line, basically. All right, that's the end somehow, surprise. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna open up to you guys for questions or comments. If discussion develops naturally, that's cool. Uh, I also have some kind of group discussion questions if it's not so natural. So. I'll let you guys start up. Does anybody have either questions or just thoughts in general that they would like to share? Deb. Okay, so you were saying uh, the exclusion of neurotypes is a possibility. Have you ever heard of like uh, what's been called neuro, neuro uh, divergent cousins or autistic cousins? Yes. So like, it's just something that started coming up where we're, where we're saying, oh, all these other people are our cousins, all these people with different diagnoses. Welcome to the group. Right, right. It just hasn't translated from the informal to the formal yet. Yeah, okay. As far as, um, yeah, you know, putting put it out there specifically, like. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. So, okay. like someone with maybe a mental health yeah. disorder, they might be a, a cousin. Yeah, like they're, they're one of our neurodiverse cousins. Okay. <laughs> so I find that really interesting. I've never heard of, like, depression or something like that being included under that umbrella. It's, it's really just started coming out because people are like, hey, neurodiversity applies to brains. Everyone's brain is different. What about every, What about mental health? Oh, yeah, that works. So that means we're cousins, right? We're cousins. It also, I guess it kind of makes it a little more palatable to people that aren't familiar with this yeah. community. Yeah. Because it, oh, they, they can understand depression, yeah. whereas they might not have had experience with autism. Mm -hmm. I, like, I like that use of that more to be a wider universal design better inclusive here. Um, I guess I know um, one of the initiatives, I work at Nationwide Children's Hospital and I work in the employee resource group supporting employees with disabilities. Um, we want to just make our organization a better 
place to hire individuals with disability and start providing these types of supports. Thing is, we still need to go through all of like the hospital policies. We need to make sure we're not breaking any HIPAA rules for employee rights. Uh, so self-disclosure is so important, but you know, everybody's scared of right. bringing something that's not normal out. Um, and then we, at the same time, we're also trying to deal with trying to train HR on interviewing practices. And you know, just because you don't get a firm handshake doesn't mean they're going to be successful at this job. Right. So. There's so many other things that we are trying to do. It's hard to figure out what to do first and in what order. Um, there's just like a lot of different things going on. Definitely. So, um, yeah, I guess what I would say is, I mean, like you said, there's a lot that's involved in making a company more inclusive, just in general. Um, I mean, I've tried to just sum it up here, like, yeah. kinda, you know, but it's not it's not that easy, right? Especially for a large company like, like Nationwide. I mean, what I would suggest to start with is, um, yeah, I mean, review your policy, as you've said you've been doing, and I would say start there. Before you get into worrying about training your staff and things like that, see where you're at right now. You know, just assess where you're at right now. And that may also mean, um, you know, maybe involving some self-advocates um, to review those policies with you, not just people who are currently working at Nationwide. Um, and I might recommend also, you know, if you can involve people from outside the organization, they and just get those fresh eyes on it could be helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I think it, you could also um, just in the spirit of universal design, just go ahead and put on your application or on. And, and usually there's a you know equal opportunity employer, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. statement. But but you could even go beyond that and say you know we welcome people you know all etc. If you if you think you might need um, support in an area, um, you know, because of a disability, um, please come talk to us. Just language that's really embracing and welcoming and inviting um, for people, you know, so that they might be more likely to disclose. Mm -hmm. uh, because it is, I mean, obviously that's it's a person's choice, but but it can be easier to support a person if you know where you're. And it's sometimes hard to know when to disclose because they're because it's quite often a catch twenty two. Oh sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say too. I mean, a lot of uh, I think most companies now are having these uh, online applications, and I think everybody's probably seen this, but like a screen where it's like, do you have a disability? And it's like one hundred and fifty things that are like a disability, like check this box, and you never know. Like if you are really honest on that, are they just going to throw that out right away? You know, you're opening yourself up to that. Yeah, you know? and technically, you don't have to disclose a diagnosis. All you right. technically legally need is, to, is for, you know, to say I need I need an accommodation. Right. I mean, you know, apparently legally, yeah, you can. Yeah, don't have to say anything until but you get that's that the reality. reality. If they give you this job, right. and then you have to be like, just like you know. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's like a, 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 my thing is it's one of the nicest things. I kind of track them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they hire me and then right. I yeah, once they hire you, they can't fire you right that's, after that's, you say that. So. That's true. Just do that. <laughs> it's not the nicest thing, but it's been the safest way to right. do it. Right. Yeah, and it's unfortunate you feel like it's something you have to hide, you know, in order to get in the door. But um, I don't know. It's, it's a complicated issue: disclosure, when to disclose, and how to do it. You know, and um, I, I don't know the answer to it. You know, um, I guess it's hard. I just said. Uh, just not clear on like what the rights are. Like, will I step in it if I disclose now or later? Or right, right. I mean, also that's the thing. I mean, stupid reasonable accommodations loophole. Right. Yeah, and that makes it difficult. Yeah, and that's what, why. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of um, employers, uh, or I shouldn't say that's judgmental, maybe to say that, but some employers um, are still stuck on this idea of what do I? What's the minimum that I need to do? But if you do more, you're going to get more. You know, your employees are going to be able to do better work, um, and they're going to be motivated to stay with you. You know, um, and I think it's tricky. I mean, putting a statement like that on your application, I think, is helpful. I think it's a very good place to start. But you need to back it up. You know, like mm -hmm. it's one thing for somebody to see that on a piece of paper or see that on a computer screen, it's another for them to really trust that you're going to be there and you're going to provide that support. The only way to do that is, is to do it, show them, you know, okay. to show them. Kind of, I'll to that maybe what you say is, here's a list of accommodations we can provide. Yes. Come, if you need more, let us know. Right. Absolutely. 
So I work with high schoolers, and I'm curious if you guys have ideas of ways that they could ask potential employers, like what kinds of questions they might ask of a potential employer to kind of gauge that friendliness. Mm -hmm. if it's <laughs> what do you guys think? I'll come it up to you guys. Mm -hmm. You guys have any thoughts? I would, honestly, I just listen to, how, I actually just listen to how they talk. A lot of the times they give, they give little tells away about how they, if like, if there's this kind of a stiffness and a formalness, I'm less likely to believe that they're going to be accommodating. If there's a more relaxed atmosphere and a little more, a bit more engagement, I start to believe that um, it might be, be it might be better. And there's certain words like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like it's like. Oh, we are. How you even say accommodations? Good to. Oh, we do provide accommodations. Now that's just like. Oh, we provide accommodations. Very different sound. <laughs> so it's like, are are like. Oh, we have this person so and so, and they've been working so and so, and I'm like, uh, yes, we have this person in this department, and this is what they do, and we've been and they've been a great asset. Very different. Mm -hmm. Something um, I would add to that, and I think is probably important, really, for any. Just an important question to ask in an interview would be, um, you know, what support do you guys offer as far as career development? Because mm -hmm. if you know that they're willing to support employees and they want to motivate employees to stay on, um, generally that would communicate to me that they're more willing um, to work with somebody on accommodations and things like that. And you can do that and ask that question without, um, you know, giving them a hint that maybe um, there you have a disability or something like that. If you're not sure if that's what you want to be doing at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would see too, um, if you can get a tour of the place, you can see who's working there and how diverse does the group look in general. Yeah. Um, I guess another thing I would add is you can ask like company-wide, are there any sort of employee resources that are offered to employees? A lot of times there'll be like specific like organization-wide policies or things for employees to do if they have a lot of options like volunteer act activities or groups to join, they seem to be a little more inclusive. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, employee assistance programs, and if your managers know what's going on in the hospital, I think, or, sorry, the hospital, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> is, if they know what's going on in the company and what the what you can offer to the employees, um, it seems like a better environment, I think. Uh -huh. Also, how, sorry. I'm oh, so sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, what? I was just thinking that it would be really cool if, like, if through Sciaxis or other organizations, if we started building a list of like the top uh, universities and companies that were the most inclusive and proactive about it, and creating like the specific, like providing explicit reasons for why they're super um, inclusive. So for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, we put out every year there's the list of the top 200 colleges and universities that are the most supportive. Of and like they list like the number of um, students present and faculty present, and then like the what specific forms of support there are. And so if we had something similar for everyone with disabilities, and then like talk about explicitly like what kind of um, things that they, that either the company or school can help in being supportive, so it's more upfront and explicit, and then like the people that are applying already kind of have. More and it would, really cool. that's a good idea it also would make if it's published it would make it a target for companies to want yeah. to make that list because yeah. <laughs> yeah. so so if you're not on that PR list that tells you something about your company right. that's not so nice yeah because yeah, we use that to like decide which schools not to apply to <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah um one of one of the sorry just hospital world we just have the usa today scores come out nationwide always makes the top 10 and it's like they marketing focuses on, and it's a lot of, it's really important for the hospital to be on that list. Mm -hmm. So that kind of list means a lot to corporate mm -hmm. organizations now. Mm -hmm. And if we're the ones putting it together, then it's like, <laughs> it could definitely, it, 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 would be a pro it would definitely be a project, but I think it's, it's doable. There's enough people in here that can do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would be a worthwhile initiative, I think. Yeah. It would be uh, a matter of I think just organizing, you know? Yeah. It's something that's important. I think um, 
So uh, Tim and I were at the ADA conference. I don't know if many, some, some of you guys yeah. I think were also there. Um, but in um, you know the main session, there, I think they talked a lot about kind of cross disability organizing and things like that, which I think was a lot stronger uh, around the 70s and that um, 70s, 80s, and that time. And uh, maybe people got a little bit more silent since that time. So What's, it could be a good way to. Well, I think the more conferences that we have that are our own will yeah. truly help. Because the problem is we don't have the natural thinking skills that other people do because of lack of resources or just that we don't get the coverage that we should. Mm -hmm. So if we keep running conferences like this, people are going to start copying something like this. Right. And it's going to get bigger. So it's just key. It's just it may sound uh, cliche, but you just gotta keep. You just gotta keep working. Right. Any other thoughts? Oh, I was just thinking about like interviews because I know uh, I'm a teacher, and so like I know in the teacher interview world, you walk into a room and there's a uh, six, five, five six people. One time I had one with one. That was fine. <laughs> I didn't get that job. But that was that was much better than walking into like a panel. And like I was just wondering if there's like any sort of like work you could do with, with groups of like cause I, I know like teaching is like you work with other people or at least you're supposed to. Um, um but like I wonder if there's like any sort of like ways to like restructure interviews where you're not like if you're just like an anxious mess already you right. just walk in there and just yeah that's <laughs> i'll be honest if there were six people i would have walked out <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's not great yeah. oh i've i've been told like if you walk into an interview and you're really nervous like you just stay mm -hmm. i'm so sorry guys i'm really excited to be here i'm really nervous like you can Put that out there, and then they know anything awkward, they'll just attribute it to that. Okay. And that's something that I mean, okay, that's relatable. That's a, that's part of the human mm -hmm. condition you know, to kind of have that performance anxiety. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it should be assumed. <laughs> you walking into I, it. I think we also need to change internet. I mean, uh, interview culture where it feels less like you're on a stage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because what you present in an interview is not act the actual reality of the employee you're going to get. Oh, yeah, you're just does. getting you're just getting some dressed up doll. Right. So if you really want to see what your employee is like, and you need to start stripping down the artificiality, but that's going to take a much longer time. But it's probably necessary. Because I'm how many people have managed to slip by presenting themselves when really they may not be qualified? Or someone who's qualified can't present themselves the right way, and so they get dropped. Right. Yeah, I think a traditional interview, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's kind of testing your ability to just be as and look good, you know? So, I mean, if that's what the employee that you want, you know, keep going with that interview style. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if you want employees to do other things, you need to be thinking about, you know, what does your employee actually need to be able to do, what's actually important to you, and, and make sure that you're looking for that, you know? But I think a lot of people, um, we've really gotten to a point where, um, you know, I think there's just this model of what an interview is, you know, you dress up, you make eye contact, you give a handshake, and I think as I'm saying this, I mean, we, as part of Aspirations, we have sessions where it's just, this is what you do. So we're spending a lot of time and energy, and people are spending money to learn how to do this, all right, when you don't necessarily need to do that for every job that you're going to have, you know. So, yeah, I mean, how do you change, kind of flip the script on that, and how do you make an interview a little bit more real, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really takes employers to make that a priority. Mm -hmm. I think it's more like we're going to have to whack them upside the head. <laughs> I think STEM is doing a good job of changing that interview process, but otherwise when it comes to 90% uh, of every other interview, it's still that same. Right. Well, and it's also that people get so stubborn and set in their ways. They don't want to change because it appears to be working. Right. I think Something that gets me too is like when you go to an interview and it's just like an HR recruiter, and I apologize if anybody here is in HR, um, <laughs> but HR seems like a strange field to me because it's like a field, I don't know, what, you know, because when you're working at a place and you know the job, I feel like that's the person who should be evaluating whether somebody else will be able to do that job, mm -hmm. whereas with HR, it's kind of this general field where you can just go 
you know, you can recruit people at hospital, you can recruit people at college, you can recruit people just many different places without necessarily knowing the ins and outs of the job. So if you're doing that, you kind of need to have a script. You need to have a checklist of these are the questions I'm asking you, I'm writing the answers on a little sheet of paper, who's had that interview, you know, where it's like this little worksheet, I've had that. Um, so part of it too, I think, is maybe being able to let go of that a little bit and include people in the interview um, or just letting the interview be run by people who are actually going to be working with this person and doing that thing with them, you know? All at? right, so we're going to have um, closing remarks in about three minutes. So um, if you guys have any more questions for Jordan, feel free yeah. to like ask in the hallway. So I just want to let you guys know. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all your comments and for being a chatty group. I didn't even need the discussion, the discussion <laughs> questions, so that's all nice. Thank you. We're not students, we're good. <laughs> <laughs>